Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Jim, we're going to be talking about a good one today, man. The Dan Clouds, the final issue of 8-Ball, the Death Race story. But first, we got some business to cover. Some new news for me this week, Ed. Street Angel, this hardcover from Ad House Books, went out of print this week. Oh, get so it while it's hot, baby. Everybody at home, what that means is we sent the last boxes of these to the distributor. They will be hitting comic stores or Amazon or whoever ordered them. But that's it. So if you're interested in this book, uh, pick it up soon. Because once it's out of print, it may be out of print for a while. And, uh, you know, if you're looking for Street Angel, the other one is Deadliest Girl Alive from Image Comics, the full color collection. This one's still in print, still available wherever you buy comics. You can have your comic store ordered or whatever. Um, I always like to push this one because this is the, the newest work, so yeah. I'm the most proud of this. But did want to do a heads up because uh, I often look for books that are out of print. And, you know, it's a bummer whenever you wait and then the, the prices skyrocket or you just can't find them. So. That's it, man. Look at that, man. Street Angel with the Image logo, dude. Yes. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor is where I'm serializing the Red Room comic strips right at this moment. Uh, we're into issue two at this point. Uh, issue one is completely available. Three bucks get you the archive. We put out new strips every Tuesday. And there's going to be some big news within the coming weeks, man, because uh, the contracts are nearly signed. And uh, the print edition is going is going to be on the horizon. So the Patreon is for the early adopter who can't wait. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. And let's get into the meat and potatoes, Jimmy, of today's episode. I the, feel like this could be its own podcast series. <laughs> uh, Death Ray or 8-Ball or Dan oh, Klaus? All of it. All of it. Everything <laughs> you've named. Final issue of 8-Ball, man. It's, it was the Death Ray for the 8-Ball series. Uh, came out in 2004, and it was uh, the coup de gras pretty much for the, uh, for the pamphlet independent comic book. Uh, I'm going to pull a comic out just to show scale. Most of 8-Ball was comic book size, but this last couple of issues were bigger than comic book size, and this one's a pretty big comic. Yes. Uh, I consider this to be the the middle book of what I call the Dan Klaus Sunday Funnies trilogy of, of books that he did. Uh, the one previous to that would be 8-Ball... Uh, Issue number, is this 23? 22. Yeah, April issue number 22. A masterpiece, too. Short list of greatest comic books of all time for a single issue. This Amazing. is going to get a video. And then there was uh, Wilson. Now, I call it the comic strip or, or Sunday Funnies uh, trilogy because the, the sort of format of these comics was uh, Klaus playing with a, one big story, but using many different styles to tell that story, and when you gang them all up together, it looks like one of those robust, you know, 1960s Sunday Funnies pages where the strips, you know, took up the whole sheet, but it wasn't quite, you know, broadsheet size. So he'd be playing with different styles. Uh, this issue gets bifurcated down the middle and becomes the graphic novel that Pantheon puts out called, called Ice Haven. And uh, it's a broad story with many, many characters, many, many styles, and it's kind of, it's kind of a really good dip in the water for Klaus to like to play with that idea. And you know what? Here's an idea for you, Dan. Do a, a, a version of this as a newsprint, as a tabloid, as like those weekly inserts that we've looked at a few of those tabloids that used to come in the newspapers. Be because it's kind of how this reads and how it looks. Yeah. Like you're collecting like all these different strips from the newspaper from a Sunday, a robust Sunday comics section. So that'd be kind of a cool object. So when this came out, man, I... Uh, you know, this excited everybody for for this this kind of storytelling. Oh, amazing. You know? Yeah, definitely ahead of the curve on this this concept. And uh, this is a guy who, with the series of 8-Ball, um, would have maybe like one big feature per issue and then have a bunch of the small strips and stories like throughout throughout the issue. So this is a uh, this is a cartoonist that likes to experiment. He doesn't settle for just like one style or motif. When it comes to storytelling, so as we grow into the graphic novel era, this is a great way to keep yourself engaged while producing big books. Yeah, he's always, I think, been something of a formalist. Mm -hmm. Talking about like the early eight ball serial, like a velvet glove cast an iron. He would talk about how he had to keep drawing in a limited style so that the late chapters matched the early chapters, even though he had grown as an artist. And the other component with him is he's a great writer. Yeah. And so like playing with those formats, you know, I, I would think of something like uh, Chris Ware's building stories is another one of these examples where they're really applying this writer approach in terms of format and what you can do with that. 
So the uh, comic book comes out in 2004, and and the drawn and quarterly, you know, he jumps ship. He, it's WCW to WWF, <laughs> and uh, you know, we now live in the graphic novel universe, man. So they slap a hardcover on it. <laughs> Dan Klaus draws a couple of end papers, and they could sell it for you know three times the price of well, the original also comic. Sell it to a bunch of people that have never heard of Eight Ball or ever been in a comic shop, right? Yeah, you'll find this in uh, your Barnes and Nobles and stuff. So it's still accessible. Not sure how accessible the original issues are. And I just want to make one wrestling correction. I feel like uh, if you're going to do WCW, WWE, I, I think Fantagraphics is, is, I would think of as the WWE. Really? J jumping ship that direction. Oh, right, right, right. Like, see, uh, <laughs> long, long conversation. <laughs> Talk about the kayfabe. <laughs> Going down the kayfabe alley there. Little Mandala effect with this comic, by the way, dude. Like uh, upon rereading it, it's been a while since I since I uh, revisited it. Um, thought we were gonna get a lot more of this. I seem to remember a lot more of this guy in the comic than uh, there there actually was. But there was a lot of cool kind of satellite material. I think uh, Alvin Buenaventura did did some cool prints. I picked this up, I believe, at Mocha one the year that it came out, mm -hmm. and was so excited. Like this was my favorite comic, favorite cartoonist at the time, all of that. So like a new issue meant. I ran there before the show even opened. You yeah. know, Fanagraphics is set up, and I got one. And it sold out. It sold out, like, the morning of the first day of the show, so it's good if you got there early. But Alvin Buenaventura had made, like, a, a I don't know, eight or nine color screen print yeah. for Death Ray. And one of my biggest regrets is not buying that. If you look through the old issues of 8-Ball, you'll frequently see these screen prints that, that would be 8-Ball-related, Dan Klaus art, and they're, they just disappear. You talk about collector items... Once they're gone, it's impossible to track those things down. And if you do find one, they're several times the original cost. I didn't buy that print, and I've regretted it ever since. <laughs> but there was a lot of coverage for this. Love this character design, too. I think that's part of why it, it's so uh, burnt into our heads that, like, oh, this book must be full of this character. Because it's, it's a pretty iconic design for a character that we're only going to see a few times in costume. Shades of uh, uh, Steve Ditko, you know, Absolutely. somebody that Klaus is a fan of. And I think you see it in that figure and in the costume. Klaus, Klaus is a big, uh, you know, he's he's a comics fan through and through, man. So so he knows the idiom of superhero comics and uh, the, the the colors of the costume, all primary colors. That was that was like rule number one over there. At DC Comics when it came to a design in your your superhero. Yeah, that's uh that's, that's funny you say that. I was just reading a Jim Shooter article about color, and he was talking about the rules of color, and that is that is it, primary colors for these superheroes. So, uh, you know, Spider-Man-like in mm -hmm. a lot of ways, but also a little more sinister. Yeah. And I love the logo. It's such a bizarre, strange lettering for the logo. I have the Japanese version, and I showed it to you, and I don't know what the fuck I did with it. Because <laughs> it just, like, it looks super cool. And an alien. Oh, well, whatever. What do you say, Jim, man? Should we crack this thing open and start talking comics? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, I'll opt to use the, the comic, but go through the hardcover. I'll follow along the hardcover if I Be see any discrepancies. There's there's a green that, that's going to come later that I'm going to be curious to see if he continued to use that same green. I did some comparisons when I was reading this this week in preparation where it felt like there were changes in here, and the ones that I looked up, they weren't changes. So it, it's just, uh, we'll see what we find. Okay, super cool, man. We open up Andy 2004, and once again, this is Klaus, uh, you know, he's telling one big story, this time, as opposed to the Ice Haven story from the previous issue of 8-Ball, we're pretty much focusing on one main character, but, you know, a handful of characters uh, throughout the whole story, so he's able to do a more focused, tighter story, playing with the motif of different styles and doing many, many strips therein. We're introduced to the, the character of Andy, and uh, would you say off the bat, He's a little bit of an unreliable uh, narrator from the start. He's unreliable and he's unlikable. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, we get it We get it right around here where he's like, you know, I don't hate all of humanity. and You know, the, the thing about the unreliable narrator part, this is something that uh, Klaus does and the unlikable character, something Klaus does in a lot of his work that I admire mm -hmm. because this is human. Yes. You know, we are, anytime Andy's talking, it's, 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 he's a good guy. It's through his point of view and his bias and that's everybody I know, including me. Sure. You know, if I'm telling you the story, I'm probably the guy who was wronged. I'm probably the guy who didn't do anything wrong. You know, that's just the way it works. And uh, Klaus is really good at writing that kind of character. And it can be off-putting to readers. I I've seen 
negative feedback yeah. to some of his comics because these characters are unlikable, but it makes for a really compelling character in a literary sense because he's so fallen. I was reading uh, through the the uh, Chris Ware sketchbooks, and he just writes these little notes to himself. And this one note, like, really struck me uh, when I think about, like, you know, the best of comics. And he's, the note to himself is something about, like, uh, the goal of making great art is to create a real moment for somebody who hasn't been born yet. And there are some things that happen in here that we can all identify with that I've never seen explored in pop culture. Uh, when Do you have anything for these pages? I, I want to point out the color is something that's actually happening, right? This is all internal. The, the one color part is all sort of Andy's internal, not exactly monologue, but kind of th thought process, thinking yeah. through whatever he's experiencing in the world. And then this is when we see color, it's like, oh, this is happening. You know, you get a little bit of this other person involved where it's maybe more objective than the rest of it. Right. The, the cool thing is about this sequence, and, fr and frankly, like these are dialogue balloons. It is literally a monologue. And uh, this is his way to get, to sell us on the character without the use of captioning and showing different sequences. It's it's the unreliable, like this happens in, in stage plays that where it starts off, character talks to the crowd and then you jump into the story. And his work is full of this kind of stuff that's comic specific. You know, this doesn't, this doesn't translate to film. It, right. would be, it would be handled differently. It could be a voiceover. It could be, you know, there are different ways you might handle this. But he does a lot of this stuff that's very comics-only sort of effects. One of the things that we very rarely see uh, in pop culture is the nerd character is usually the, the lovable, like, you know, wh why doesn't the rest of the school see what we see in that character? But in truth... And you probably could fucking name names. I know I certainly can. There were nerdy kids in school who were there in that position because they were fucking assholes and pieces of shit. Antisocial. <laughs> I'll point out Ditko Spider-Man is that way. He's not Peter Parker's not that likable in Ditko Spider-Man. That is a flawed character. If you're referencing some Ditko, it makes sense here. Also, I'll call attention to the origin of Andy, this title, this blustery kind of superhero vernacular title. Klaus is a is an exceptional writer. I mean, he has a at least an Academy Award nomination for writing a screenplay. I can't remember if he won Ghost that World. or not. Yeah. Um, but I mean, in, it, very uh, calculated in the language he uses. And this being a superhero comic, we're going to see things like origins and, and that kind of language. And this two-page spread, uh, we're very quickly, you know, this is four pages into the comic. We know who Andy is. He's basically orphaned, living with his grandpap. His friend Louie even asks, like, what happens if your grandpap dies? Your grandpap who is belligerent and certainly in at least at the beginning of the story, the early stages of dementia, right. it's going to get accelerated as the as the story progresses. Uh, so, you know, he's the boy's on an island, man. He doesn't have anybody. No, this is his girlfriend who is like somebody he met at camp or something and writes letters to. And, and throughout the story, you'll see she doesn't respond to those letters. As, the, as he becomes an adult, there's some sort of incident with her. So he really is isolated. There, there's, there's nobody really in his life. Louis kind of a, he's a piece of work himself. And we'll see that as the story unfolds, but is only real person he talks to. And there are those those scenarios too, man. Like you've seen it in school where like there are the kids that sit at the lunch table with each other just because nobody else will accept them. It doesn't mean that they're friends. Right. <laughs> what do you think of Andy? And and now we get the perspective of the kids at school and what they think of Andy and he's almost a non entity. And another example of a comic trope. You know, this is not something that would be easy to do in other media. I love this little sequence here because it really pays off a little bit later when we see where the hostility in Louie comes from. He's at the dinner table with his mom, with his sister, sister's boyfriend, and he's like a hippie out of central casting, <laughs> like a real kind of, you know, Matthew McConaughey, Days to Confuse kind of, kind of character. And, uh, you know, L Louie doesn't like him. It's a great family I'm... dinner scene. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another really good uh, sequence with this, with this character, Stoob. There are maybe three or four, like, if this was standard average piece of pop culture, this is your bully character, right? right? And we see maybe three, four incidents involving Stoob where the kids are fucking pieces of shit assholes to him first. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you don't see that 
in Freaks and Geeks or something like that. This is one of the other characters, too. There aren't that many characters, so it's worth noting. This is kind of the housekeeper, caretaker character, mostly there to take care of uh, of Andy's grandfather, um, but one of the few people in Andy's lives. You know, like, we can list, it's grandfather, it's Louie, it's the housekeeper, caretaker, is basically who Andy talks to. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not, not, not much in his life for that, so. But maybe the only kind of wholesome good character in the entire book right and also like the only woman really that that andy's interacting with so it's mother it's uh fantasy it's it's every every role that you know a woman might occupy in your life is all wrapped up in one because that's the only woman in, in andy's life is that a little call back to ice haven could be or eight ball reference right <laughs> Louie yelling out the window insults right, at, uh, at, at Stoop. Stoop. Yeah, he's they, really he pokes the bear over and over throughout this. So whenever confrontations occur, it's hard to sympathize too much with Louie, who goes out of his way to interact with Stoob antagonistically. Crime number two against Stoob. I don't know if it's this green that that I wonder if he he kept that in. You know, it just looks better on this paper. I think could be, and it could be micro corrected too you know Klaus pretty famous for going in and just making the, the tiniest of adjustments wouldn't surprise me if he pulled uh, you know 10 percent of the cyan out of that green <laughs> <laughs> Klaus busting out his serif uh, hand 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 lettering font for the, the uh andy letter to his quote-unquote girlfriend dusty and this has shades to me that just this page has shades to me of like those iconic jack kirby pinups that would be at the end of issues whenever you know there were a a few few less ad pieces or whatever you know i can imagine you know there's an invisible woman version of this it's just missing you know marvel masterwork yeah you mentioned the paper ed it is beautiful the colors on these on these pages i think this is only his second major color work after ice haven so he's starting to do this digital coloring and kind of learning his way but whoever helps with this fanographics production people or whoever like they pick the right paper i mean it's it's really a beautiful printing job john k not uh chris Velusi, but john Kuramato helped those guys a lot with yeah this. i think he gets a shout out of thanks maybe in this this book edition all right dude now now we're going to get into uh we're starting to get into the real origin of uh, our character's superpower cigarette the the lettering feels like it would have been like the kind of lettering that would be in like the ads of uh like the comic book ads that would have been in comics at that time. It reminds me a lot of like the Sunday Peanuts. Sure, yeah. Yeah, with the top masthead and everything. I do think the cigarette is a fun choice though for all those reasons. I I like it for like I think that that's shades of old clouds. Around this time, Quesada implements the no smoking in Marvel Comics policy. Like in in real time, you know, around 2004, like even Wolverine put out the stogies, buddy. Yeah, that's Those days are over. <laughs> It could and be a reference to how comics were treated, you know, forever comics were this underground medium, even the Marvel DC stuff where it was like, it's a child's medium, throw it away, you don't want to be seen reading it, it's garbage. I mean, that's a little bit of what you're getting here is comics become graphic novels, Klaus is kind of, you know, put, put this, let's, how does he trigger his superpowers? Let's do a cigarette. <laughs> let's remind everybody that this is trashy origins of comics. <laughs> Oh, it's so good, man. And this is the ex- exposition of like, you know, this is the Wolverine, I'm the best there is at what I do kind of captioning where he's feeling, you know, the pulsing surge of the nicotine going through his body and he could perform super heroic actions. It's so amazing, like what he does to, to show us that. Rip the Odyssey in half. Hilarious. <laughs> Lift a car a couple inches off the ground. <laughs> And I mean, there's literally like he's a wet noodle and there's little drips coming from his minuscule bicep. Yeah. So you superhero fans at home man, enjoy that. Enjoy that strip. (laughs) Next day at school, uh, we're going to get some glimpses of uh, Andy's Andy's power in action when uh, Louie and Stube are going to meet in the courtyard at, you know, 3 p.m. and settle their differences. He even gives him a chance to get out. You sure you want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he beats the shit out of Louis. Nothing. But how about this? Louis' friend sees this happening and thinks maybe the cigarettes can help him. But that's such a great panel of his head in, in shadow. It's almost a mask. Like you could see a superhero mask like that, where the bottom part of the face is still sticking out. Jimmy, it's the only way you could get a guy with a Dutch boy haircut to look sinister. <laughs> 
almost no country for old men, like the little brother of uh... <laughs> for sure, man. Really interesting texture with uh, the stoop hair, and uh, we're, let's let's go the opposite of Kirby. Let's not give you the moment of impact. Just show you a little of that aftermath. It's a cool panel. It's just a word balloon. It's the only thing in that panel and some of those speed lines. That's a really interesting panel. Reminds me a little bit of some of the stuff Chris Ware does with text in panels. But yeah, that's that's a great storytelling gimmick for a fight. Kayfabers out there, like let's see the How to Draw Comics, the Marvel Way version of the Death Ray, man. Because there are a <laughs> lot of things in here that would look super fun and it would be totally kind of like out of context if you ramp it up with Kirby energy, some of the fight sequences. Uh, there's one panel in particular that's going to come come later that I would love to see with some How to Draw Comics to Marvel Way treatment. And by the way, these first like 10 pages would all be condensed down into like your origin blurb. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're trying to get to this point. <laughs> you have like a six page sequence of him beating Stube up. And he passes the hell out. And uh, now we have the origin of uh, Death Ray. You know, they, they saw what kind of prowess uh, Andy had with his, you know, he could he could throw throw them thangs, man. And uh, Louie immediately is like, he's he's the Steve Jobs of the crew. He like he wants to call ownership on on Andy's talents and abilities. Yeah, and we see Louie undergoing changes, too. He goes to New York, finds punk rock, cuts his hair short, comes back. He's a new guy, kind of the same way. Andy has changed, uh, you know, they're both reaching this point, right? And a lot of Cloud, you know, Ghost World being Cloud's probably best known work, similar territory of like that coming of age, that change that, you know, you're going through between adolescence and adulthood. You're getting some of that too with these characters. Glad you brought that up, man, because uh, like Black Hole, Charles Burns' Black Hole, uh, Klaus opts to use a, 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 a childhood environment that he can relate to and be a little bit more honest about personally because once you start drawing those comics the outside world kind of kind of accelerates in time when you're still thinking people wear boss jeans and cross colors hoodies and shit so using a period of time that that he sort of knows well to try to you know make the the whole situation feel a little bit more real to him as he's drawing the thing but what happens here is you know we establish cigarettes give this kid his powers so he's uh He's he's become a smoker, man. He's he's trying to see what he's uh, he can do. He keeps a low level of nicotine in his body at all times, but then he gets he gets uh, the nut up to smoke whole cigarettes here and there. The housekeeper sees him on the streets, drives him home, and uh, Andy's grandpa, when he's waiting for you know his punishment or whatever, his grandpa comes in, brings him a package that was never open, and and just said that uh, you know your dad your dad left this for you, and wanted me to give it to you whenever you started smoking. Yeah, it's a it's a strange origin. I love it. It talks about his dad, the scientist who died of cancer, I believe, and uh, had experimented. It ex ex exposed Andy to some uh, hormones or something whenever he was younger. It's ridiculous. It's a it's a Marvel you know superhero origin, but it's there. Like once once that cigarette appears, it sort of triggers this revelation from the grandfather. And just looking at this, Ed, notice how much the grandfather uh, resembles Louis. Ah. I don't know if that's intentional or not, but I usually give Klaus the benefit of the doubt and assume there are very few accidents or coincidences that he's not planning for. So, I, you know, I wonder if those two mirror each other in some way in their role or their influence with, with Andy. There's good stuff here, man. So so Andy's dad uh, was a scientist, and that almost automatically implies nerd and somebody who might have had a hard time in, in school. So he wanted to sort of give his son the leg up and he was hoping he was hoping that, that Andy would have started smoking at 13 a little bit earlier so, so that he could use his superpowers for more of his high school career. But Andy's such a nerd that he didn't start smoking until he was 17. Here's the mandala effect, man, because I thought there was a lot more of this in, in the book uh, than there really is, man. But this two-page spread, freaking incredible, especially given the, the fact that the original art is drawn way bigger than your 11 by 17 image area. So I think this is in the Dan Klaus Studio Edition, reprinted in, uh, you know, the exact size of the original artboards. Amazing. Yeah, I'm going to go home and look at that artist edition again, just from looking through this. <laughs> but this is kind of, this is the, the apex of the superhero part of this comic, at least in terms of the art presentation. 
this is, you know, even nods to image comics with a two page splash, because that's not something you were getting in, in the typical 60s, you know, Marvel DC superhero comics. There weren't two page splashes back then. That's true. That's true. Jim, critique that gun, man. It looks like a 10 out of 10 to me. Yeah, I'm happy with that. I, I bet there was some reference involved in drawing that gun. <laughs> it is funny, this part, and you see it in different superhero stories, contemporary superhero stories, is like, what do you do once you have these powers? It's kind of impossible. And you see a lot of that, uh, of these guys, you know, trying to figure this stuff out. Like, what do we do with this? As you get to be an adult, it's the part that doesn't add up with like kids' superhero comics where it's like, oh, I'm just hanging out in a building and I see some some muggers or, or somebody's <laughs> going to commit robbery or whatever. It's like, eh, I don't know, man. You sit on buildings a long time before you witness that. One of the good uh, I- examples that, that I remember it was like in uh, in uh, Fight Club, whenever the the uh, the homework was to go out and get into a fight and people were like trying and people were just like, get the fuck right. away from yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, a version of this. <laughs> All right, then uh, they're, they're playing some Sandlot baseball. They can't figure out what the heck to do with the powers, so Andy's going to put it to use uh, at, on the baseball field. But of course, in Clousian fashion, all he does he hits that ball five blocks away, but it's still just a foul ball, foul and, ball. He, and he and he swings out. I mean, he, stri- he strikes out. <laughs> yeah, the plan was to hit a line drive back at, at some kid they hate, but uh, not not quite there. This was always in my mind the argument about steroids and baseball. It's not going to help you hit the ball. It may help you hit the ball further, but it's not going to help you hit that ball. Sure. Playing with colored inks here, too. This is like a very deep blue rather than um, just the the um, dark black. Coach reaches out to Andy, too. It's a chance for... And he even looks like uh, Louie before yeah. Louie got the haircut. Right. And it's almost like this would have been a lifeline. This would have been an alternative life for Andy if he follows that path or gives that a shot. So, you know, it's a chance to not be isolated. It could be dicey, man, depending on who you hook up with and who you find kinship with when when you're in school, man, and, and sometimes... Oh, when you're in life, too. I mean, what's the easiest way, you know, to, to succeed or fail is who you surround yourself with. Absolutely. Jimmy, did we skip a part where a freaking squirrel got got its comeuppance? No, 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 we haven't. We haven't seen the death ray yet. Okay, okay, cool, man. Um, the Adventures of the Death Ray... So Andy has his powers, he's sitting there smoking, and uh, this is like that Fight Club scene where uh, we got Louie, he's he's the bait, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he's the bait, those cuff jeans, man, that would catch that would catch a fist to the jaw in Homestead. Yeah, this is this is the furthest thing to, even if this turns into a fight, it's so far from a crime. Oh, I know. You know? <laughs> like it's, they're just trying, he's like, whenever this doesn't work, Louie's like, maybe we can go to Arizona and, and beat the shit out of my dad. He, that's what I mean, he really wants to like take ownership, like he, and, and Andy has this power, but Louie's the guy that wants to put that shit to use ASAP, and we see so many examples of it early, and that's important for a little bit later. Yeah, Louis has a lot of hubris, and uh, he's kind of the, the brains yeah. of this operation, at least in his mind. Which ain't saying much. No, it's not. <laughs> See, again, be careful who you surround yourself with. If Louis's the leader, you're in trouble. <laughs> this is Stube reaches out to Andy to come to uh, to come to his party. Louis smells a trap, and uh, in the middle of this, there's this fantasy that uh, Andy has about his grandfather dying, but. Nothing comes of any of this, really. You know, they go to the party. They wait outside to see what's happening. It looks like a normal, you know, normal party. People just hanging out. And uh, they smell ambush. Yeah, yeah. Louis, <laughs> Louis, sure, that's not. They're just waiting for him to show up. And they imply that they do something to Stube's car later on. Stube's going to want like 240 bucks for it. We don't see it. In my mind, I thought they flipped it over on its roof. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't happen in either of these editions. So right. it's just in my head. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's like this Mandala effect that, that just happens from... You remember these comics different than than they really were, man. Uh, so that we just passed the adventures of Death Ray. Let's go to the further adventures of Death Ray. So now, uh, since since Louis ain't good bait, they're gonna put out a wallet with some money in it. <laughs> and then this, I was gonna say, and he picks it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then his feller in his brown suit, Bell Bottoms picks it up, goes to the the alleyway and the kids confront him that this is my wallet homeboy says finders keepers louis comes up to him you're a fucking criminal and then, and then, <laughs> criminal. He, and then he's like guys i really need it like <laughs> like I, I can really like use this money 
And then, of course, you know, he runs off. And, and fuck implies that uh, they did not get the reaction they were hoping for. Yeah, certainly no satisfaction from whatever way <laughs> terrorizing this poor old guy that needs the money. <laughs> Andy's sex fantasies about his, his housekeeper. Uh, we have we have Louis here. It's like Louis fishing for a reason for for Andy to use his powers. So and I think that blue signifies some some bullshit. Some this is, this is uh, Louis's version of events. This is how he's fantasizing that this this girl I assume he has some interest in is uh, is really needs him right in, in this version of events. <laughs> <laughs> now now this is this is fun stuff. So they're gonna go confront. And and this is this is Andy. We've seen we've seen in the past like all this shit like shit. Fuck me, Andy. Like all this stuff. We've seen it before, and you imagine that it was like masturbation thing. But now we get to see who who. His this masturb- is a strange. This is a, a great drawing for like a fantasy where he's almost not even there. Like like he's such an empty cipher in the fantasy. <laughs> right. Here's the girl's father, and the boys are gonna go confront him. <laughs> and what I love about this the most is uh that even when the boys start fighting this guy they're kind of such milk sops in a lot of ways that the guy's still just worried about the dog so he's getting punched by these kids and he's like hey don't let my dog get away and he gets a good one in and then as they leave and wrap wrap up like it could have been drawn straight right like it could have been these two dudes you know dusting off their their shirts and walking home but how does klaus handle it man superhero and sidekick yeah. genius yeah even nods to like 60s tv batman <laughs> but it's still a dan klaus comic right so like when we get back to school the next day that girl comes up to him and it's like you fucking pieces of shit my you beat up my dad and my dog ran away forever and i'll never i'll, I'll never see my puppy again this is a strange bit is there uh fantasizing and going through this whole process in the fantasy we then cut to andy like in uh, back back to reality, right? It's it's, uh, it's almost like there's two versions of Andy existing in this in their weird world. Yeah, and that's a great use of the real estate of of the page with that panel right there for sure. So we see what uh, I, I like this so much, man. We see what you know. This is the idealized version of uh, you know how, how Andy sees himself. Let's take a look at what it really looks like, man. I don't know when this came out in conjunction with Kick Ass. But, you know, that comes to mind. I think this preceded Kick-Ass. I think so, too. And we have a page with an honest-to-goodness crime actually happens while he's wearing his gimmicks, man. A couple of crackheads are still on this dude's television. Andy chases him down. The television falls. There's no good ending to that moment. Yeah, it's unsatisfying. And he even, like, he's finally found some people doing a crime that he can stop. And he says it kind of... It, doesn't feel great kind of feels like homework (laughs) and i don't know that it's even we're even sure that that these are the same guys you know they're in shadow so uh, andy you know takes a couple of puffs and just gives them the what for slinks back home yeah that mask is so funny compared to the uh the real the i don't know fantasy i guess death ray mask yeah man the dutch boy haircut still sticking out (laughs) he looks you know it's like a uh Fat Albert character or something. This is the double heel turn of the issue. This target practice page, man, where they get a hold of the death ray. I'm trying to figure out. I was thinking there was a scene where the death ray arrives, where we see him get the death ray in the mail. Yeah. But I I, I don't see it anywhere. Like they talk about it in, in the page we just saw. He talks about that process of getting it from his aunt, but we never see it arrive like in the box or whatever, which not a, big deal except if you start thinking about this in terms of like how much of this is fantasy right how unreliable is andy as a narrator because here we are with the death ray the title of the book the death ray they've gotten hold of it It looks like a hair dryer or a kid's toy or something i'm so glad you brought it up because what what you're essentially saying is is like the the richness of the story creates like such a mental picture that like there are things that we remember visually but like they happen in words and there's a lot of that here and that's the beauty of co- reading comics where the captions don't, don't explicitly tell you what the fuck is happening in a picture of the same panel yeah it's almost the ingredients go in your brain and then it plays out there in your head right yeah it's it's it is weird rereading this and noticing these things that i thought i saw yeah 
and it's established Louis Louis don't know what to do like the death rate doesn't work with him you need some biometrics in that shit dude it's got that it's got the um the iPhone thumb thumb uh recognition shit in it man it's if you think about this as all being fantasy it's almost like everybody's an angry youth right we're mm-hmm. all full of angst at that age and he has the capability to kill and it's where they separate he and Louie. You know, it's not necessarily, if, if the death rate isn't real, I mean, that's what you're seeing as a separation. What makes these two characters different from each other is almost like that thing in your brain that allows you to be Jeffrey Dahmer right. versus everybody else who's angry and, and outgrows it, you know, kind of internalizes it or whatever. Uh, pretty interesting. But this was a this is a haunting page. This is when things really start to take a turn. So they start out with bottles, you know, like you might do if you had a BB gun or something to play with. And uh, Andy's able to make these things just disappear and the the haunting thing with this gun is there's no answer to what happens do right. they teleport somewhere do they are they alive in another dimension an alternate alternate universe or what like they just disappear with no sign of ever having been there no ashes nothing and that's displayed with this little uh right now it's squirrel. time to try it on something alive yeah you, you quickly graduate with that bb gun from your uh from your bottles empty glass bottles to uh this... there's a squirrel over here that has no idea what we're planning <laughs> and art style change he's a different guy after this happens super ominous man like in that bed staring at this up at the sky you see his clouds like in the room and it's just like we don't know what he's thinking he just did a big thing he took a life and we don't know what he's thinking and that adds to the haunting nature because this could go any number of ways there are a bunch of these panels that Klaus draws where a character or an object is barely in the panel. I just make note of that because as we go forward, you're going to see more of it. Yeah. And it sort of adds to that sense of unreliability where it's like, what are we, what are we looking at exactly? There are, I'll point them out as we see them, but it's a pretty interesting thing for... I've never done a panel like that. Sure. Uh, so many cool choices. Mm-hmm. So many choices that are the antithesis of uh, your Marvel comic. And and this is one. Like, I, like how would you not push him back and like let us see all the energy and kirby fucking crackle coming out of that thing yeah it's really some bold decisions it adds to that sense of being just off you know uncomfortable it's almost david lynchian in that sense of like it just doesn't feel right looking at this about to introduce one of my favorite characters of the strip (laughs) man sunny so this strip uh shows us kind of the hostility that louis had with that boyfriend when they were at that that dinner table earlier in the comic because he's still friends with an ex-boyfriend of his sister's who's way one of these guys way older than than the boys you know like lets him lets him drink beers in her house or whatever and just laments that uh you know she, she's no longer with him that that guy she's with now he's probably feeding her drugs and shit and and it, this is the kind of stuff that louis parrots uh, at the dinner table whenever that guy's sitting there yeah, there's a lot to unpack with this dude. For one thing, we start out with with having Andy get a haircut that looks like Louie's. Right. But then he goes and befriends Sonny, who has a haircut that looks like Andy before he gets the Louie haircut. Right. And, you know, a lot more in common with... This guy could be Andy. This this could be, you know, t- 33-year-old Andy. Uh, hanging out with that guy is just such an uncomfortable thing to make a connection with, too. Um, they find the dog. They find Lucy that ran away. And uh, Andy thinks, great, you give that back to, to Janet, she'll, she'll, she'll be you know, right back on board with you. And he's like, no, I'm keeping the dog. So <laughs> Lou, everybody's a dick. Yeah, like, like even right here, let's see, man, uh, Louie kind of flippantly says something about like, hey, man, you find anything else to, to incinerate and, and murder? And this is where Andy finally gets his nut up with his homeboy. And this, right, this moment creates the tension going forward. Because I mean, Louie knows what uh, Andy's capable of, probably better than anybody else in the universe. And now Andy's getting, uh, he's sticking up for himself in a certain way. He's just like, yo, don't ever joke about that, man. You can see it too in the stature. Andy is now bigger than Louis. Right. And and it shows in every panel pretty much. Yeah, it's it's neat. It kind of haunts, I don't know if it haunts Louis or if it's something that he's just kind of sticking it to Andy. But even when he's like, of course I won't tell anyone about the gun. It's like, Andy didn't ask you that. <laughs> Andy wasn't worried about that. You're bringing that up on your own. Like, you're, you're, you're holding, you're almost threatening by saying that. He's, uh, he's definitely holding Andy at, a, at an arm's length uh, from, from now on, but he's not above 
putting use to the weapon as 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 we will see in the future but but you know andy has some guilt with what happened with that squirrel at this moment of the of the comic and you know he's going to try to make up for it by giving the squirrel a little bread man there's there's good story stuff there's good character stuff in in that as well and look at this he's like pinning up a squirrel like <laughs> photo or something a xerox of a squirrel like on his little bulletin board at home all this after he's talking about I'm a straight shooter, literally or figuratively. This Andy's dream piece. It's him being becoming more alone. You know, it's dreams about his grandfather losing it, you know, basically losing his grandfather. And then it's dreams about that caretaker, you know, sexual fantasy dreams about this caretaker, which is just not a relationship that's ever going to happen. So in a way, like his connection to her is being pushed away, too. So that would be my my takeaway with that. So on the previous page, when we introduced Sonny, uh, he was obviously, like like you said earlier, everybody's the hero of their own story. And Sonny was telling the boys about all of the 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 stuff that went wrong on, uh, you know, Teresa's part, Louis's big sister, why, why they broke up and everything. And we're just getting one nice moment with Sonny to see if, uh, if there's any validity or truth to what he said to the boys earlier. And uh, he slaps himself in the face. He's very bipolar, this guy. Yeah, he's he's like everyone else. You know, you see him just falling apart as this strip unfolds and he's drinking and, and undressed on the floor and notes that he's not really going to send. Like everybody else in this story, everyone's a wreck. <laughs> so the boys have it in their mind. <laughs> the boys have it in their mind that Stoob is the ultimate bad guy. You know, he's Bluto. He's fucking Dr. Doom. And they're going to prove it and, and create a good reason for why he needs to be erased off the face of the earth. So Louis is Louis is casting himself in the role of uh, the girl tra- tied to the train tracks. Damsel in distress. <laughs> and Stoob's just like, get the fuck up, you dork. Gives him a little, little kick to the kidney. And <laughs> I just love it. He's like, now, do it now, Andy. And Andy gets a little bit quitus interruptus. It's so great. Come on! <laughs> just pleading with him to come out. And all it was is like, you know, these two little like jabs. That, that ain't even, uh, these ain't big kicks. It's not, it's not Gary Anderson kicking a field goal. <laughs> That's a deep cut. <laughs> yeah, the, the best part for me is whenever they're having their argument with Death Ray in costume. Imagine Stoob standing there witnessing this. Yeah, it doesn't help the case for some of this... Uh, you know, if some you thought, of this, if you these thought you were fun of at school before, <laughs> be happy there aren't cell phones here with cameras filming this. That's goddamn right. This this part with Sonny uh, lets us know that Louis definitely has been talking about uh, Andy's powers because Sonny's putting out feelers, man, talking about all kinds of uh, wrongs that are being done with Louis's big sister, and that uh, it wouldn't be a bad thing if her boyfriend. Well, wasn't around any longer. All that happens on the same page as uh, Andy's fa- grandfather just deteriorates even further, man. The dementia's taken root. And the housekeeper's just like, Andy, what the heck is gonna... You know, what the heck's gonna happen to you? It's uh, talking about her daughter, and it's just like, you know, don't ever take drugs, Andy. Yeah, that fits in too. I mean, the whole idea is that Teresa's current boyfriend is into, into drugs to some capacity i mean that's what he says he's you know she's killing him there's a lot of drug talk in this which in a way i mean i guess the cigarettes even fit into that that's what triggers this power so i think that's you know you mentioned charles burns and black hole earlier i think that runs through this story too kids and drugs there will be a call back to this exact piece at the very very end <laughs> and we have the stakeout man the rooftop stakeout where they're stalking, uh, this is the boyfriend. We saw him before at the dinner table, and he's done. Yeah, argument for that panel uh, some time ago where they're shooting the gun, and all we see is, like, the pop sound effect. You see it reinforced here. Um, you know, this was that original panel that you had mentioned, like, it's kind of a weird composition. Let's let's see the gun in the center. But the pop is your indicator, right? That's, yeah. That's the what we need to take away from how the gun works and what this means. And what it means is they just killed this dude. All right. And Andy does it with almost no... I think he felt worse about the squirrel than he does about this guy. For sure. And this is where the flip happens, man. Uh, Because Louie is almost immediately uh, just guilty about the thing. He he 
his conscience is is uh getting the best of him that happens a lot like as kids i've been in situations man where it's like you do do dirt and do dumb shit with your friends and then uh someone gets guilty yeah and louie ends that conversation with so who do you think you're gonna kill next <laughs> and which andy doesn't take kindly to right grandpa needs way more help than uh than dinah can can provide so she's tapping out man she's done <clears throat> I think this may be a color change. Yeah. Just, just a more desaturated, uh, not dreamlike, but maybe a little bit less vivid, less, uh, you know, that saturation's almost like the dying, right? When, when you, when you see, when mm -hmm. you see this green on the page, I don't think that this was his intention of like this, this like, it, it's very overpower. It overpowers the black of the line. Uh, and there's also this moment of consideration of, do you put the old man out of his misery? And we see what happens with that at the end uh, as well. Another dusty letter, man. <laughs> and and this is like when this is a desperate dusty letter. This is the one where it's like you haven't written to me for a while. Like, do you still love me? It, like, basically, everything that is said here is things that you don't want to say to somebody that you like, and, and uh, if you don't want to uh, push them a fucking continent away from you. Louis gets a girlfriend, and he's a big milk sop. What's about it? Because he has certain guilt, he like they killed the guy. They they made a guy disappear, and he can't say anything about it, man. So he's kind of breaking down. I think we're gonna be reaching our climax pretty soon, Jimmy. Louis has an idea, man. But uh, Andy, where's the gun? You need to you need to pull that thing out, dude. We got it. We got a mission. <laughs> Andy's such a doofus, man. Sitting there eating with Grandpa. Get a knock at the door. Here comes Miss Dinah's uh, daughter for her her last her last check. And Andy just asks, are, oh, are you the crackhead? <laughs> are you the one on drugs? She's like, no, nah, that's my sister. Cut to school. This is Stube getting his revenge, man. It's a little bit important. It shows that Stube's a dick. You know, it's like in a lot of ways we've, we've framed Stube as being, I don't know, Louis bringing it on himself, mm -hmm. being an antagonist. And he is. But also, Stube is a like everybody's a dick. <laughs> Everybody in school at this age, you're an asshole. You know, nobody wants to stay seventeen forever. It's it's the or at least you don't want to be around a bunch of seventeen year olds. Maybe we all want to stay seventeen, <laughs> but you don't. You know, like that's just a terrible age. Everybody's sort of this way, and and Stube's no different. You know, something happened to Stube's car that these guys did. Like, yeah, Stube wants to give back a little bit. <laughs> it's a. Uh... It just speaks to the multi-dimensional nature of right. these these characters, which is which is incredible. You just don't see that in superhero comics. Exactly. I was going to say the same thing. That's a huge difference that you would get between a DC Marvel comic and this. It sucks. You need some villains that we can be happy whenever they're death raid. <laughs> All right, man. Yeah, this is the big moment, right? So this is his aunt coming to say, you know, you're going to have to come live with us. And... Uh, a little bit of business before that. <laughs> and he has the death ray. Louis is leading him to, uh, leading him somewhere on some kind of mission. I like this progression of like medium to uh, long shot to super long shot. It's just a really nice, I don't want to say cinematic, but it's a nice progression just from panel to panel to panel. It's a, it's, it, it really sells good movement too, because uh, Louis like kind of leading the charge for a little while and then he starts to fall back a little bit, man. Kind of get get the the high ground on uh, on Andy. And then we're interrupted. Modern Pretty interesting day. from the uh, from a narrative standpoint because something is obviously building with that Andy Louis scene. Right. Talks about falling off the wagon, and you know, and he's this, you know, he's a he's a doughy middle aged guy, man, lamenting, you know, his his past, you and and once again. He's still the guy who's always being wrong. So a couple divorces got cucked out by the, by the, by the ex-wives and stuff. This is all of these like, uh, kind of pink panels. This is again, almost a callback to the beginning mm -hmm. blue panels where he, this is him talking. This is his internal rationalization of what has happened in his life. And he talks about falling off the wagon. And it reminds me so much of like people who smoke and they try to quit and then they come back to it. In a weird way, like if you remove the death ray part, that's what you've got here, right? This guy who started smoking at a young age and has been battling that addiction his whole life. And then he's showing these incidents and, and sort of from his rose-colored glass point of view of what actually happened in these incidents and why, you know, whoever he beat up deserved it. Right. 
And here's our climactic moment between the 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 two friends, man. Yeah, back to the present, except to the past. <laughs> the time is great in this. <laughs> Got to put Andy down, man. We saw uh, there was some parts earlier where Louis gave Andy a call and was just like, you know, when we killed uh, my my sister's boyfriend, like I don't know that he needed to die, like feeling lots of guilt over what uh, what transpired. And Louis, you know, it's. Louis's got to put put the kid down, man. The kid, the kid could be a menace. The kid. Yeah, this is a great scene, and it starts with this is a continuation of his monologue. He's talking to us, the readers, not to Louis in these first couple of panels about what happened. And this is where he talks about sending the gun away after this incident. I see. Yeah. And then, meanwhile, this is kind of snapping back into reality, where Louis tries to brain him with a rock. One of my favorite pieces right here, man, this panel here. This is the one where yes. it's like, let's let's see that in how to draw comics the Marvel Way fashion, right. because that would be like, you know, the super vulgar. Yeah, it'd be the guy like <laughs> jumping sideways, the gun sideways, he's shooting <laughs> as he's going down. And all we got is just a little ellipse of uh you know, the circle uh, of the, the tip of the, the gun with a little bit of foreshortened uh leg. Yeah, it's a really that's another one of those examples of panel of interesting composition. In this case it's great because this is where Louis should be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's a great panel, too, for all those reasons. And you're right. It can't exist within the Marvel idiom of comics. Jim Shooter wouldn't stand for it. That's for sure. No. <laughs> sends the gun off, and he, he uh, sends the, probably, I guess, his last package to Dusty. Uh, <laughs> sends her this toy ray gun. <laughs> and, and says, put it in your closet. Don't open it. You know, he continues talking about his divorces and getting cucked out. This is where it happens. Getting cucked out by, uh, you know, tenants upstairs, you know, having sex with his wife or whatever. Uh, and he's talking about, like, like, I know what to do. When you're reading this, you could think that, like, what he needs to do is, you know, unrequited love, dusty, you know, go see her, go, you know, be too middle-aged divorcees finding love or something there's a lot of uh every interview that i read about about this work in 2011 whenever the book was released Klaus did a bunch of interviews and they talk about how this story he did this story in the ramp up to like the invasion of iraq and afghanistan after 9 11 and so there was a lot of that influenced this story you know might not be like explicit in the story sure. but it's there the other piece that i think of with that is the ramping up of social media the, the beginning of like you track down your old girlfriend because right. you know now now everybody can do that in their in their bedroom on their computer and i wonder about that in terms of like yeah let's see what dusty's up to my life's been kind of hard these last couple decades let's let's try to get in touch with her that's the solution i feel like all that stuff was probably influential you know it's probably in the air makes perfect sense man because uh you you always hear about people like and guess who's bald? And guess who's fat? Right. And look at look at what happened to poor Dusty. Yeah. She, she she almost looks like uh, Tina from freaking like a velvet glove. <laughs> Little potato head, bad hair, great bad hair by the way. Thin. <laughs> yeah, the thin eyebrows. All of that's 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 really good aging. The aging throughout this whole comic is really great. Mostly it's it's Andy, but even you know like Sunny. We see Sunny here years later. All these enablers, man. Uh, Sonny's, Sonny's thankful because Sonny got the girl. You know, once once that drug dealer guy, like the 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 guy they made disappear, go away. Sonny got the girl, and he's forever thankful to Andy. He doesn't know what happened. He doesn't exactly want to know what happened. But it's you know it's the beginning of Godfather, man. I'm gonna ask a favor that you can't refuse. Here comes Andy, and <laughs> I think it's still like these guys are like Chicago or something. Uh, Sonny gets a knock at the door and has to tell his woman, I'm driving to California with this dude. Yeah, there are some big time. It's like three weeks later, we track down, you know, this person or that person. It would be impossible to track down this death ray. Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. But they do it. They catch a lucky break. <laughs> and here is the dusty fiasco, man. Andy's kind of just peeking over the uh, the bushes while, while Sonny's giving her a speech. He was a bill collector. Perfect kind of guy to like for that job, by the way. <laughs> the news ain't good, man. She got rid of all that junk. She probably tossed that shit in the trash that day when she got that package and 
And uh, Sonny's like, yeah, she doesn't have it, dude. But they track it down at like an antique store. And uh, at the very end, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll see sort of how, how we put the shit to use, man. But not before running into Stube at uh, the final hour. Actually, it is before he runs into Stube. Because here's another one of those panels of like the barely visible death ray shooting the guy on the bench from a long way off in the back because the guy, you know, told him not to litter or something. <laughs> Whatever the confrontation was, completely disproportionate. Uh, but it's that kind of like all of this stuff just barely happens. And he even says a fucking action movie line right there. <laughs> Who am I? Your worst nightmare. Bumps into Stoob. Stoob's running, you know, got, a, got his own business. Scrap yard. Makes sense. Stoob looks good old, too. Like, all of these characters, he does really good, like, aging all of these characters. Here's a crazy thing, too, man. There's the, like, when he makes Louis disappear, like, Louis's folks, like, his mom, Louis's mom didn't even, like, really question him. He got away with that shit scot-free, and in fact, he got a dog out of it. That's the dog that ran away. Uh, well, this is, like, from the lineage. Yeah, several uh, dogs later. He, 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 he delineates all of this. It's almost <laughs> biblical of, like... <laughs> Lucy begat Sparky. His, he spends more time on his dog history than his ex-wives. <laughs> right. The last page is, is my favorite page, man. Yeah, this is the real like showcase of this is a horror story. <laughs> and maybe every superhero story is a horror story when you get down to it. Why did you destroy Andy? So here's the guy that uh, delivered that sold drugs to uh, his daughter. These are the dudes that cucked, cucked him out. So he takes those guys away. There's Louis. And then, uh, you know, what do you think of Andy? Of course, Sonny. Sonny digs him. And we also see that Andy finally did get the balls. Like, it's off panel, but he made Grandpa disappear. Right? Or is that just death? No, I think that's Grandpa disappearing. I think. That's how I would... That's how I interpret that. Sure. I do, too. But if he did die naturally... Then that, that that means that these guys didn't get pushed into any other dimension. They're worm food. Yeah, you know that may be a better uh, a better consideration is remove the death ray from existing, and these are people that he killed. Grandpa may have died mercifully, maybe with a pillow over his his face or something. Uh, you know, depending how you want to interpret that. But I definitely think it implies that he, it's at Andy's hands, one uh, way or another. Choose your own adventure ending. I like these a lot, and again, it points out kind of the uh, the darkness, you know, what, what, what this story is, because it's either he kills everyone and he's the last person on earth, or he kills himself, or he dies of alone of lung cancer. Right. You know, like, it's this whole story is just loneliness. It's loneliness and it's adolescent fantasy. The whole superhero thing is built on that adolescent fantasy, and it's like, if you lived your life that way, this is what, this is your outcome. Right. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, we, totally. we, we can't be 14 forever. Like, following the chronology of, of his work is really, uh, it's really interesting because you have Ice Haven to begin with, where he's playing around with the motif of these multi-panel, um, these multi-page sh strip things that are like, you know, Sunday Funnies pages. He ramps it up with this, like, very focused story um, with this Andy kid and, you know, not really playing around with style too much you know there's little bits here and there but it's it's pretty yeah it's much more restrained than something like the ice haven when he first decides this is a cool idea and then he takes both of those energies and puts them applies them to wilson you know where he's playing with different art style and doing different strips like you know different single page strips for everything we'll get to all those videos at some point i wonder if there's any uh i think about andy and his relationship with these dogs but Klaus has a dog. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know that it's an indictment of dog owners, but it is like the only relationships that seem to be uh, pleasurable for Andy is the relationships with these dogs, which is this kind of one-sided thing. That's in uh, that's in Wilson as well. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe it is an indictment of dog owners <laughs> that he's aiming at himself a little bit. I, I, I don't know. Self-awareness like is, is definitely a theme too, and, and the lack thereof. And the lack thereof as self-defense mechanism, perhaps. Yeah, and I think that has to exist. I do too, to or else you just go extent. nuts. Right. You know, one piece that we um, that we glossed over, and I was thinking at one point that I might have made it up, is 
the last time we see Miss Dina is uh, Andy makes a pass at her. All right. And that's kind of when she leaves. Like, it's partially Grandpa's getting to be more than she can handle, but also, like, Junior's getting to be more than she can handle, too. And and just, like, the the perfect cartooning on her eyes, there's, that's, that's a exasperated look, man, with just, like, you know, three brush strokes. Yeah, there's a lot of that, though, you know, where he's, you know. It's clouds, man. Cartooning mastery. This is an incredible story. This yeah. was another one of those nails in the superhero genre coffin for me of like, I, you know, it's it's Brat Pack, totally different sensibility, but that same thing is like, yeah, I guess I can't look at that stuff the same way. I, you I, really have to shut off a big part of your brain, I think, for that genre to work. I don't even want to say in an ironic way. You know, I don't know that this is ironic. I think this is an amazing superhero story. I think it's one, it's one of my... I top five if, if not number one for me i would highly recommend it if people are watching this video and they haven't read this if you love stuff like watchmen do yourself a favor man this is a fun this will be a fun read for you if, if, if you really hold watchmen in high esteem yeah and that's part of the reason why we had to do this video man we got to introduce our wizard uh readers to uh some other cool superhero comics that are out there that they may not have thought about get out of here jim yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I mean, this was a massive... You know, the other way to look at this is the end of 8-Ball. It is, yeah. Uh, you know, my yeah. money for the best comic book series that I can name, uh, this was the capper. So, phenomenal, important, iconic issue in comics history as well. Can't put a better capper on that, Jimmy. K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when the next vids are available. Octobriana's in stores. Street Angel, nearly out of print. Get it ASAP before that thing costs you $500. <laughs> Patreon.com slash Ed is where I'm serializing my uh, Red Room comic strips. Three bucks, three bucks will get you the complete archive, and issue one is up there right now. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe merchandise and t-shirts at the links below this video. And I should mention... Uh, November 20th to the 26th, we're going to have free shipping in our spread shop uh, for t-shirts and merch. It's kayfabe free ship. Uh, and that is the link below this video, but the code word is kayfabe free ship. Good to know, man. Give them one more set of merchant orders and we'll be on our way. Read more comics.